and then we will uh, hear from me again. Um, I will be talking to you about what stewardship is, how we define that here at the Land Trust, as well as um, what a site steward is. Um, at 10.30, we're going to be hearing from two current site stewards, um, Ed and Zoe. So if you're Ed and Zoe, take note of that approximate time of 10.30. Um, then I will be sharing again, um, talking about how to perform a site steward visit. Um, we'll go into depth of um, the app that we use and what you'll be looking for and all of those things. Um, then we're going to hear from another guest speaker. Chris Peck is going to talk to us about the birds that you might find in the Nisqually watershed. Um, then we're going to be hearing from Maya, who is our Community Engagement AmeriCorps member with the Land Trust. And she's going to be sharing with us about the various types of salmon that you'd find in the watershed in the Nisqually River, the Michelle River, and surrounding creeks and streams. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to be sharing uh, a property overview of um, each of our properties and why you might want to choose to steward those. Um, it'll be an overview, but it'll give you a sense of what you might be interested in. Um, and then at 1150, we're going to wrap up and I'll share with you how you can move forward in becoming a site steward or getting more involved with the land trust. Um, so now we are going to transition into um, getting to briefly know a little bit about all of you. Um, if you can find the chat, um, we'd love to have you write in the chat where you're from, just briefly a little introduction. And then we also have two polls that should pop up on your screen. Um, one to find out where in the watershed you're from, as well as what your involvement with the Nisqually Land Trust has been in the past. Um, just to understand who you all are. There's um, a lovely group of you here today and I recognize some of you and a lot of you are new. So if that is happening, Courtney. Yeah, I have a poll going. Can people see the poll? Great, okay. I guess I'm the only one who can't see it. So that's awesome. Um, <laughs> Do people see it or not? I'm not sure. I may. I think we'll be able to see it when the polls ended, and then oh, cool. Uh, then we can see the results. Which Great. Will be cool. So we'll just take a minute or two here to do that. Um, you can write it in the chat. You can answer the poll. Well, it looks like almost everyone has answered the first poll question, but I'll leave it up for a couple more seconds right. to see. If we get more responses. Oh, we do. 27 out of 27. Okay. So I'm not Let's sure. Oh, let's see. see. Maybe. Can people see the results? Yes. That's fun. So it looks like we have people. I can't see them, but Courtney, if you want to let us know, let me know what they are. Yeah. So it looks like we have a lot of folks from the like Olympia and Lacey area. We have folks from Eatonville, Yelm, McKenna. Uh, DuPont, elsewhere in the watershed, and some people outside the watershed. So it's cool that we have um, a wide range of representation. Doesn't look like we have any Ashford people, unfortunately, but pretty much everywhere else is represented. So that's cool. Um, and then I've got one more little poll that I'll do to see how much people know about the land trust already. <laughs> If you do have a question that's a little more in depth or you wanna ask it verbally, you are welcome to do that. We're gonna have um, two Q and A times when open for anybody to ask a question. Um, do keep in mind that I think if you're asking a verbal question that your voice and or video will be recorded. Um, we are gonna be posting this recording on YouTube later on. So keep that in mind if you're, hoping not to have your video or voice recorded. Um, and then uh, do know that a link to uh, sign up to become a site steward will be provided at the end of this workshop via the chat, as well as in a follow-up email that I will send out later today. So keep an eye out for that. And then a reminder to please stay on mute unless you have um, raised your hand to ask a question. So that can be 
um, putting, I think there's a little yellow hand button on your screen that you can click and that will indicate that you've raised your hand and we will call on you to ask your question. So that way we don't have many voices speaking at once. Um, and we do have um, someone here who would like to also help welcome you today. We have our executive director, Jeanette Dorner, um, and she'd like to say a few words of welcome before we get started. So Jeanette, if you're here, you have the floor. Thanks, Lati. There's a lot of screens, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know where you are. <laughs> Somewhere in the sea of faces. Hey, everybody, I'm not going to take too much time because Lati and the team have a great lineup for you today. I just wanted to say hello. My name is Jeanette Dorner, for those of you that don't know me. Um, I've been the executive director for a little over a year here at the Land Trust, um, but I'm not new to the watershed. I grew up in the watershed and I used to work for the Nisqually Tribe as a sand recovery program manager for about a little over a decade. So just wanted to say hello and say thank you to all of you. It's just a, so wonderful to see folks that have been with us for a long time and also some new folks checking, checking out our program. We have lots of amazing properties throughout the watershed that are so important and so special. And we have a pretty small staff team to help take care of all of those properties and keep an eye on them. And so this program is just so important to have folks like you in the community that can help us keep an eye on those properties and make sure that we take good care of them. So thanks so much for taking part of your Saturday to attend this and to um, see about helping us take care of these properties. All right, I'm done. Lati, back over to you. Thank you, Jeanette. Glad you could make it out here this morning as well. Um, so next up, we're going to hear from Courtney who Courtney Murphy, our stewardship assistant, who's going to talk to us, get us through an overview of the Nisqually Land Trust to take us through the watershed. So over to you, Courtney. Yeah, if you could move over to the next slide. Cool. Um, so as Lati said, my name is Courtney Murphy. Um, I know quite a few of you. Um, I'm the stewardship assistant for the land trust, and I've been doing that job for um, about two and a half years now. Um, and prior to my time as stewardship assistant, I was the uh, Washington Service Corps volunteer coordinator for the land trust. Um, so I spent, you know, quite a bit of time overseeing the site steward program and um, our other volunteer programs. Um, so yeah, I'm familiar with the program and excited to still be uh, a part of it. Um, so yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of background info about the land trust for those of you that don't know. Um, so it will help you contextualize what Lottie's going to be talking about a little better. Um, so first off, um, the land trust was founded in 1989. Um, we're a nonprofit conservation organization that acquires and manages critical lands to permanently benefit the water, wildlife, and people of the Nisqually River watershed. Um, so in our early years back in the um, you know early 90s to late 90s early 2000s we focused on the acquisition of wildlife habitat in the lower salmon producing portion of the Squally River um, so that's the 42 and a half miles between the Lagrand Dam and the Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge um, salmon can't get above the Lagrand Dam um, and because we were really focused on salmon habitat recovery and restoration that's where we focused um, so we acquired a lot of property along the Nisqually River main stem, um, as well as some salmon producing tributaries such as the Michelle River and Ohop Creek. Um, and yeah, so we try to get those riparian properties, um, restore them with, you know, planting and basic species removal to improve air quality, water quality, um, and habitat for salmon and other wildlife. Um, um, today, we protect and steward around 9,000 acres throughout the watershed. Um, so this is through property that we own, um, properties that we hold conservation easements on, and also property that we have um, assisted with partner organizations um, acquiring and managing. Um, yeah, we were accredited by the Land Trust Accreditation Commission in 2013. Um, not all land trusts are accredited, so it is a pretty kind of big, I don't know, distinguishing factor, I guess. Um, and for accreditation, we have to, you know, keep a lot of good records, do a lot of specific like stewardship um, things and monitoring on each property. So it's like, it's kind of a big deal. Um, 
And we, like Jeanette said, have a pretty small staff. So we need volunteers and um, supporters like you to help us uh, achieve our goals and our mission. Um, we really couldn't do it without you. We started as an all volunteer organization and have just kind of developed a staff over time. So yeah, really crucial that we have volunteers. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so all of our work is situated within the Nisqually watershed and the Nisqually um, Marine Conservation Initiative area. So that is the lower portion of Puget Sound, um, kind of by the Nisqually Delta up to Anderson Island, you know, kind of around Anderson Island. Um, but yeah, the Nisqually is a really special place. Um, some things that make it special um, are it has its headwaters in a national park, so Mount Rainier National Park. Um, the Nisqually River comes off the Nisqually Glacier and flows down to the Delta um, in the Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. So it's really cool that both the headwaters and the Delta area are both federally protected. Um, yeah, you can see some little, some stats. I'm not gonna read out all the numbers, um, but all the stats about like the size of the watershed, um, the river miles, so the river 78 miles long, 42% um, or 42 miles of that is accessible to salmonids, like I said before. Um, and something that's really cool about the Nisqually River is that about 76% of all salmonid accessible main, main stem shoreline is permanently protected. So that's through um, work by the land trust um, and other partner organizations, um, you know, agencies, et cetera. So that's pretty cool. That's a huge portion of the river. Um, and so it's cool that we get to be part of that protection. Um, move to the next slide. Um, here's a little map of the watershed, which features um, kind of the area that we protect as well as area that our partners protect. Um, I think this map is actually a tiny bit out of date, but it's mostly correct. Um, so as you can see, the watershed comprises portions of both Thurston and Pierce counties and a very tiny percent of Lewis County. Um, the Nisqually River for the most part is the boundary between counties. So like the north side of the river is Pierce, south side is Thurston for the most part. Um, all red, so like there's that large red box by Ashford and some other little red boxes. Um, those are all land trust properties. And then I don't know if it's big enough to see, I can hardly see it. Um, but there's a key that shows you like what the other colors represent. Um, so anyway, big portion of the river protected. Um, yeah, and we kind of focus in three different kind of portions of the watershed. So the upper portion, which is actually like the lower portion on this map, um, around Ashford, we focus on protecting kind of larger um, former timber stands for the purpose of creating future old growth habitat um, for wildlife species such as marble murrelet, northern spotted owls, and others. Um, the middle reach of the Nisqually, which was our kind of initial focus area, is where we focus on that riparian salmon habitat. Um, and then the lower portion of the watershed, which is the Marine Conservation Initiative area, we focus on protecting um, kind of like near shore and marine habitats for salmon. Um, yeah, and then one more thing I'll say on this slide. So we protect property a few different ways. So the primary way we do it is through fee ownership. So that means um, property that we actually own and have acquired um, either through like donations or um, purchases. Um, and that is the bulk of the property that we steward. Um, we also have several conservation easements. So that's where another landowner owns the property, um, but we have um, kind of an agreement with them where we're protecting certain conservation features on that property. Um, and then the third way is through um, partner projects. So like the Nisqually Community Forest Project and several others. Um, yeah, so we've protected about 9,000 acres, which is really cool. Okay, let's move on. Um, yeah, now I'm just gonna go over um, some priority habitats in the watershed. Um, so first is mature forest, so that's up by Mount Rainier. Um, like I was saying, so that is where we're trying to you know, promote old growth habitat environments for northern spotted owls, marble murrelet, et cetera. Can move on. Um, river mainstem and riparian forest, so that's a huge 
um, part of that central portion of the watershed. Um, so riparian just means along the river, so forests that are along the main stem and tributaries. Um, wetlands and side channels. So these types of habitats are really important for all sorts of wildlife, but especially bird species, um, young salmon. Um, so yeah, that, that's connected to main stem habitats usually. Um, and then near shore bluffs and coastal lagoons. So that's kind of what we're trying to protect in our Nisqually Marine Conservation Initiative area. Yeah, I think that's the end of my slide. Oh, um, and last thing, stewardship and restoration partners. So since we're such a small staff um, and rely so much on volunteers, we also rely on a lot of our, a lot of different um, conservation partners to help fund projects and complete projects. Um, so these are just a few of the other agencies and organizations we work with. Uh, I'm not gonna read them all out, but I'll let you look at the slide for a few seconds. <laughs> um, but most importantly, many volunteers like you. Awesome. Thanks for sharing all that, Courtney. Yeah. So moving along, um, I'm going to talk to you about, first off, what is stewardship? So this is how the land trust views stewardship. Um, these are not all aspects that you will be involved in as a site steward, but this gives you an idea of what, what we do and the stewardship that um, the staff here get involved with. So first up, there's about six um, aspects to stewardship. Um, the first one is invasive species control. So this involves manual and mechanical means as well as herbicide to work towards the removal of invasive species. So in this first photo, we have um, myself on the right and then Maya in the middle and Courtney on the left. Um, with our weed whackers and we're out at Powell Creek floodplain removing blackberry um, using weed whackers. And let's see, up next we have, this is a work party, a volunteer work party at Thurston Ridge Thurston um, using weed wrenches to remove scotch broom. Um, and our next facet of stewardship is planting and maintaining riparian forests. Um, so this is um, going in and planting, um, replanting, um, and maintaining those plantings um, through plant protection, protector installation and monitoring of those sites. So here's a few photos from um, recent planting work parties. Um, these were both taken out at um, Powell Creek floodplain as well in the fall. And moving along to our next aspect, we have um, removing infrastructure. So this is removing infrastructure that might be on a property that we purchase um, that can't exist without detriment to um, the surrounding land and our conservation values. So sometimes a building or um, shack or whatever it is, is um, at risk of going in the water or falling apart and creating a lot of debris in that area. Um, and then moving on to garbage and debris removal. Um, this is something that we come up against a lot at our some of our sites. Um, this is a dramatic example in this photo of um, an overturned car. And I believe it's a hot tub um, that was left at one of our properties. Um, but often it's just, you know, your usual smaller debris, such as bottles and clothes and other such things. And um, that's definitely um, an aspect that site stewards can help us with, whether that's actually bringing a trash bag on your site visit and picking up smaller things or just letting us know that it exists and we dealing with it or um, even getting a contractor to come help us out. Um, next up, we have um, improving in-stream habitat. So this can look like using large woody debris um, to create areas in the river where salmon can go for shelter, um, as well as a place that helps the, support the bank from eroding. Um, here in this photo, we have an engineered log jam on the Michelle River at our Van Eaton site. 
Um, and log jams are great because they can help create a, a slower moving pool um, of water um, for salmon to take shelter in. Um, and then a last aspect of improving in stream habitat is also um, stream and creek remeandering. So that's something that we've worked on and are continuing to work on in the OHOP Valley with OHOP Creek. Um, and lastly, we have ecological thinning. So um, with ecological thinning, it's really important for us to provide a diverse um, ecosystem for the wildlife in these forests. So in order to do that, we need to have enough sunlight getting through to reach all the plants that are in the understory of the forest, as well as um, trees, young trees that are just getting going and gonna grow for many, many, many years. Um, so moving on. So now we're getting into talking about what a site steward is, but before we do that, we're gonna talk about some qualities that a site steward might have. So if any of these seem like something that you possess, um, I'd highly encourage you to think about becoming a site steward. So um, one quality is if you want to take responsibility for a land trust property. Um, if you want to commit to making four visits a year to the property, ideally that's seasonally. Um, and if you want to learn all about Western Washington ecosystems, and if you, or if you have um, already lots of knowledge on the topic, that's wonderful to have your expertise or help show you the ropes. Um, if you want to report your findings to the Nisqually Land Trust, um, so if you're willing to take a moment to write things down and let us know. Um, and then also if you love to explore the outdoors, um, then I'm sure you'll enjoy our site steward program. So here we are, what is a site steward? Uh, a site steward is a committed volunteer who chooses one or more land trust sites to come back to um, again and again, ideally four times a year. If you can't come four times a year, nothing bad will happen to you, but that's our ideal goal. Um, and being a site steward increases our capacity to monitor, monitor these properties. And it also allows the community access to our properties, it allows them access to the work we do and the learning through that, um, and allows us to feel a sense of community in the work that we do. So, um, so in terms of going back to what stewardship is and the aspects of that, that a site steward would be able to help us with, um, I'm gonna go through that now. So first up, we have monitoring. So this involves you going out to the sites and observing and then reporting those observations to us. Um, this, this helps us to get info and feedback on the changing conditions at our sites, um, whether positive or negative, and help us to better um, steward that site. Um, next up, we have maintaining. Um, so that can look like I was mentioning um, garbage and debris removal. So bringing a trash bag when you do your site visit and picking up things that seem manageable is a great way to support us as well as letting us know sometimes immediately. For example, if there is an overturned car on our property, give us a call, let us know. Um, and then another um, aspect of maintaining is also if you run into other folks out on the land, um, being a kind and um, welcoming face to other folks and neighbors and letting them know why you're out there and what you're up to, that's really helpful for us to maintain good relationships with neighbors and the rest of the community. Um, next up is stewardship. So actual um, physical labor, um, removing invasive species, um, your 
I'll go into this more later, but um, it's something that you can either, there's some uh, invasive you can re remove by hand. There's also some that you might, you need a tool and you can always borrow those from us at the land trust. Um, and then there's also the potential for doing some planting um, on your own with pre-coordination. Um, and then the stewardship aspect also ties into the community aspect. So something we encourage you to do is to um, have some sort of small work party at your site. So that could look like um, bringing your family, bringing a few friends. It could also be um, having other site stewards come out and help you on a project that's um, needed at your site. And with all of that, um, we'll support you and help you coordinate that. And um, it's a great way to involve other people and make the work fun. So let's see next. Um, okay, so we've reached a new section of our workshop. Um, right now we're going to hear from two current site stewards, one longtime site steward and one more recent site steward. Um, our first person we're going to hear from is Ed Kenny, and he is going to share about his experience being a site steward for um, the last while. So Ed, if you are on the call, I know you said you might be calling in from your phone. Um, you can unmute yourself now and um, share. If you're not here right now, we can move on to Zoe. Um, but Ed, if anyone sees Ed on here, let me know. I see that he's on here. I'm not sure. I saw his video a little bit ago, okay. but I, do I hope he's not having a hard time with Oh, I see him. His internet. Um, Give it a moment here. We could also have Zoe go first if she's on right now. I think Ed is also called in um, on his phone and I just sent him a notification that I asked him to unmute on the phone okay, number. Okay, I'm unmuted, but oh. I think I'll get an echo. echo, echo. I'll get a better uh, transmission through the phone. Okay. Okay. Um, mm. Ed, are you able to um, unmute yourself on your phone so you can talk through there? Here, I'll see if I can just unmute him manually. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, good deal. <laughs> okay, well, um, okay. thanks, Lottie. I'm Ed Kenny, of course, and I live in a solar log house that my wife and I built right above the Nisqually Land Trust Pal Creek Complex. I started being a land steward when I retired from teaching high school, and I really have enjoyed every year at this position, even though it keeps changing. My monthly routine at the property has changed over the last decade, and it's becoming quite exciting this particular year. More about that later. George Walter, uh, the founder of our land trust, was a member of the Nisqually Delta Association, and I'm now the president of that uh, organization. And when he decided to start the land trust, he worked for the Nisqually tribe. He would handle threats to the river, like oil and gas pipelines crossing it, by coming to some settlement agreement with the companies or cities involved, and then he'd acquire, through the settlement, funding for river restoration. My method was more to gather up a couple hundred citizens and march on the city council chambers. Uh, both methods had limited short-term success, and George told me one day that we needed long-term results, so we are going to start a land trust, and we'd simply buy all the riverfront properties. I remember laughing at that suggestion because neither George nor I had much money. I became a charter member of the land trust with a small donation. I don't know if you can see this, but this is, this is the, what the charter membership looked like. 
and um, George's first acquisition was the spot where Pal Creek joins in the Squala River, right below my house. So I was delighted with this purchase, and I'm happy to report that the land trust now owns more than 500 acres of the creek I live on, Pal Creek. And the results of these purchases are really starting to achieve impressive results. Timber activities had destroyed both the fall and winter coho runs on Pal Creek just after I moved here. And I'm overjoyed to tell you that both of the salmon runs have returned this year. I saw salmon babies from last year's spawning head down the river in October, and I saw the mature salmon come up uh, to spawn early this December. And most amazingly, last month I saw the first winter run return after our storm waters receded. It's been 40 years probably since we saw those. To make these coho salmon returns possible, it took the Nisqually Land Trust, uh, Trust partnership with a number of other organizations. And I was glad to see your slide that showed all those organizations. The winter coho salmon, they come up to the Land Trust Pal Creek properties, but there are no spawning gravels there, so the coho take a right turn into Elbow Lake Creek, where the South Puget Sound Salmon Enhancement Group has decommissioned the old road and removed all the uh, culverts put up by the timber interests. They once blocked these salmon runs completely. The coho continue on under the new salmon enhancement bread that Thurston County built last year. And I should mention it, they, Thurston County was not on that list, but they built two salmon enhancement bridges, one on Tabaton Creek, which also has two runs of coho, and then one on our creek, Pal Creek. So they built that bridge. It's magnificent. And I've already complimented the commissioners on their action. Anyway, so the salmon go under that bridge, and the spawning breads that are closest are another 300 yards further up the creek on land um, that my friends own. Like Glady was saying, I think it was, or Courtney, it's really important to get to know the people along our properties because they can really help you out on a lot of activities. Many of them volunteer on the properties I work on. It's been so exciting to walk these creeks with a coho hatchery manager uh, from the Nisqually tribe and hear him say that these wild fish we saw this year are much bigger than the ones in his hatchery. I also walked the creeks with one of the Squally's tribal biologists who appreciates how many hundreds of volunteer hours it's taken these, uh, it's taken these salmon to come back, and most of that is from the Squally Land Trust volunteers. Many of the delights of being the Squally Land Trust steward are not as spectacular as this, but they are rewarding. My main job as a land steward is to be an observer of the Powell Creek properties and note the wildlife I see, the evasive plants that need pulling, and any new threats that need me to notify the proper authorities. This has included cars on fire, my discovery of two meth labs, a whole truckload of debris from a rental property dumped on our property, illegal fishing hut on the banks, and old logging equipment left along skid roads. Observing the wildlife on the property is a special treat. At the right time of year, I expect to see eagles, hawks, western bluebirds, and several varieties of woodpecker. In addition, it is not unusual to see a herd of elk, a few bear, a bobcat or two, and even a mountain lion. We've seen six so far. One we saw last year was seven feet long and captured on a neighbor's camera. It was amazing. Lately, I've started to see milk and weasel, uh, mink, excuse me, and weasel also after I track their uh, tracks along the creek. New project I've started the last three years is trying to get the trees and plants we grow at Powell Creek to do better. As mentioned earlier, we do a lot of replanting. Some of the agricultural lands there on Powell Creek are contaminated by the previous owners, especially the raspberry farmers' use of fungicides, herbicides, and pesticides. There are entire acres without a single earthworm, mushroom, snake, or lizard. In addition, there is little carbon or nitrogen in those soils, so it makes it much harder for trees to grow than when we plant them out on forest clear cuts. My solution is to use the peer-reviewed work of Linda Chalker Scott and Suzanne Samard to guide my efforts. I'm buying or getting uh, donated every scrap of arborist mulch I can and even using straw bales and Douglas fir shreds. 
or bags of leaves that are donated. It's just really easy to see the difference this year because last year we had that unusually hot June, June weather. We lost thousands of plants and trees. And you can see the ones that I've mulched uh, are doing much better. Anyway, I'm happy to see you all here uh, considering this land steward position for the Nisqually Land Trust. It makes a difference. Being a land trust uh, steward, it gives me lots of exercise every week, and it puts a smile on my face. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ed, for sharing all that. And it came through loud and clear, so good oh, job. Oh, that's good to hear. <laughs> um, I have one thing to say uh, just about Ed's. So Ed has, like he was saying, really has taken on a, a huge project with mulching these plants. And I have also noticed um, just an improvement in soil quality. Um, so when the first year I was on staff, when we first planted that property, we saw almost no worms, like, you know, dug thousands of holes and found maybe a couple worms. Um, and then on the most recent planting, we found worms almost in every hole. So, um, you know, definitely the mulch, mulching project could be contributing to that. So thank you so much, Ed. Thanks, Courtney. Yeah, so Ed's taken it upon himself to have his own fun and do his own project on our property. And so we always welcome that. Um, so next up, we're gonna hear from Zoe Chamberlain um, and she's gonna tell us about her experience being a site steward um, just over the past few months. So Zoe, if you're ready, you can unmute yourself. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Zoe Chamberlain. As Lottie said, I've been a site steward for uh, just a few months. I started in October of 2021 and I've really enjoyed my experience so far. Um, it's been really good as a learning opportunity for me as an ecology student at the Evergreen State College. I'm a junior at the Evergreen State College studying ecology and education. And so, yeah, it's just been a really good way for me to apply my learning. Um, so I'm a site steward for the Lower Reach uh, property, and that is along the Nisqually River, just north of Yelm. Um, and so this property is a mixture of riparian forest and upland forest with some shoreline habitats. Um, and there are several open fields because this piece of land has been subject to timber harvest. And so you can see the effect of, disturb of human caused disturbance on the land. And being a site steward is a really cool way that I can make a mark in trying to facilitate forest growth. Um, so yeah, I really enjoy this opportunity too because I can use it to meet my own goals and there's a lot of variability. Oh, sorry, can you go back to the last slide, Lottie? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of variability um, and I can use it to fit my own schedule as a full-time student. I have a lot of things going on. I also have a job, so it can be hard for me to make it to work parties, but I can come to this property whenever and kind of volunteer and feel like I'm giving back. Um, yeah, so that brings me to my first point of why I really enjoy this and one of my goals, which is giving back to the community and the land. Um, so being a site steward makes me feel really accomplished because I feel like I'm doing something to help like the greater good. And it shows the difference I can make in ecosystems. Um, so for example, this picture is a sapling that I uh, transplanted, it had planted itself in the middle of the trail. And so I just kind of dug it up and moved it to one of the more open fields where we're trying to facilitate forest growth. Um, and yeah, it's just that feeling like I can make a difference and I'm helping not only the land, but also the community because as a community, we're so tied to our land, even though it may not be relevant in our day-to-day -day lives, it really makes a big impact. Um, yes, yeah, so you can go to the next slide now. So uh, this is one of the reasons I really love being a site steward is how it helps me with my academics. Um, so I can take my learnings from my classes and apply them in being a site steward. So for example, I had a class on restoration ecology, which went so well with this project because I was able to go and apply my learnings. And as you can see in this picture, pull a bunch of scotch broom and do things like that. Um, I'm also focusing on plant ecology, 
So doing plant physiology classes, I can come back to the lower reach property and see how plants are changing with the seasons and kind of connect that to what I'm learning. Um, so yeah, it's really cool opportunity in that way. I'm also an education major, so I'm able to bring friends and family and teach them what I'm learning through this process. So for example, it's my boyfriend in the picture and that day we pulled a bunch of scotch broom and I was able to explain to him um, how scotch broom has big impacts as an inv invasive species and kind of spread my knowledge of what I'm learning through this. Yes, yeah, so you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, and that brings me to my next point of, it's a great way to connect with friends and family. I like to bring other people when I go to the property. So in the picture, it's one of my friends, Aubrey, and it's a great place to just go and take people that I enjoy being around and go walk around the forest, look at some mushrooms. This was a really good mushroom day. There were a bunch of things popping up all over, um, which is exciting because that's another great sign of soil health and forest health is having a good um, like mycelial network in the soils. Uh, yeah, and so just getting to connect with friends and family and talk to them and teach them about ecosystem restoration and ecosystem rehabilitation. And yeah, just get everyone excited about it. Yeah, so that's all I have to say. It's been a really fun experience so far. Thanks so much for sharing, Zoe. It's fun that you've been able to bring out friends and family. I think that's definitely a very fun part of it. All right, so moving along, um, I'm going to be talking to you now about how to do a site visit as a site steward, what that entails, what you'll be using to do it, and give you a little sense of how that would work. Um, it's going to be an overview. I'm not going to go into every detail, um, but I'll give you a sense. So starting out, um, what we use to do the site steward visits um, in order to report them and to gather data and information for the land trust is that we use this app on our phones or on a tablet um, called Landscape. And Landscape is a land conservation database um, and you can use it to track your route um, that you take walking around the property. Um, it'll prompt you to answer uh, questions about what stewardship you did, who you ran into on your site visit, plants, animals that you saw, et cetera. Um, it allows you to add photos um, that then drop as a point on the map so you can go back and find that exact site. Um, and then it syncs um, and uploads all of that data onto the database, um, along with all the stewardship work that the Nisqually Land Trust stewardship team does. So then it's all in one place um, and accessible to all of us at any time. Um, so that's the uh, software that we use. And now I'm gonna go into sort of what to do before you go, when you go, and then after you go and do a site visit. So, um, so, okay, so step one um, is be prepared, pack for the unexpected and bring your binder. Um, so your binder is something that you will get when you um, sign up to be a site steward and I will go with you um, in person to your site the first time and show you around the site and um, walk you through doing a site visit. And I will give you this binder, which includes a lot of things that will help you um, before you go, such as um, a checklist of things to bring and emergency contacts and written documentation of um, how to do a site visit. Um, so I'll tell you more about the binder later. Um, let's see. Um, and yeah, it'll help you um, help plan what you need to bring to your site visit um, in order to do the work that you're hoping to do that day um, or see the things you're hoping to see, such as birds, bringing binoculars, etc. cetera. Um, so before you go, you'll also download um, a file of your site um, from the landscape app. So it'll download the map so that when you're in the field where you may or may not have cell phone service, you will be able to access 
that map and all its features and information and fill out your site visit. Um, so that's something you'll do before you go. Um, it's a quick button. Um, and then like I was saying, bringing um, items that you might need um, to do the various activities such as walking, photography, birding, removing invasive species, whatever that might be. Um, so moving along, um, this is what the app looks like, um, the inside of the app. So um, it has, it contains a, a, a map of all our properties. Um, it shows the boundaries, it shows previous site visits, it shows the details about the site. Um, and I'm just gonna quickly walk you through how you would start a site visit. So you would go to the, um, the search bar at the top and you would type in the name of your site. For example, here we're looking at Hogan Bay. This is the site um, that uh, we um, have done a work part, a couple work parties at recently. Some of you may have been there. Um, so you'll go, you'll type in your site, um, and then you'll click on site visits. Um, you will also notice the prepare offline. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, but um, there's a prepare offline button. So that's what I was re referencing before. Um, but you'll click on site visits. And then uh, the next um, image is showing what will pop up once you click on site visits. Um, and you'll select the drop down, um, tap on the drop down, and select volunteer site steward. Um, and then you'll click uh, start visit. So this is something that you do at your site. You're starting your track. It's going to track where you walk, where you go. Um, so once you start your visit, it will update the time that you started. So this is really important in terms of us keeping track of your volunteer hours. Um, and then this is your reporting form. So it has all the questions and details that you will then be letting us know about. Um, and when you go, you can walk the path of least resistance if you choose. Um, you can also choose to bushwhack all day probably in some areas. So it's really up to you. Um, you can stick to the property boundaries is always a great place that um, you know is an important aspect for us to know the condition of, but you can also meander through um, at your leisure. Either way is good. So um, when you're at your site, I was mentioning that you can take photos um, at specific points to document what you're finding. Um, and that way we at the Land Trust can see exactly what you mean without you having to write an essay about what you saw. Um, so here um, we have uh, the various uh, buttons that you can use to sort of document your visit. Um, the first one is the camera button in the first image. Um, and that allows you to take a photo right where you are. Um, you can describe the photo um, and it'll just be right there on your track at that location. The next um, button to look at is in the second image. Um, and this button uh, allows you to create sort of a polygon um, area on the map. Um, this is definitely um, not necessarily accurate, but helps us get a sense of an area where you might see a large area of Blackberry and you wanna indicate, it's not just right here, it's really this whole area. So that is really helpful for us to understand the um, size of an object or um, invasive species. And then in image four, this one shows you what it looks like to have a track going. It shows you the photo points um, what those will look like um, and shows you how the image will pop up and letting us know what it is that you see. Um, and when you draw the polygon, you can use the thumbs up or thumbs down button to um, say whether it looks accurate. If, it's, if you click thumbs down, you can draw it again if you mess up. Um, so that's how that goes. And then um, when we're out on the property, some of the things that we'll want you to look for um, I'm going to go through those now. So um, property boundaries and signs. So um, these are important for um, making sure that people know it's our property, know when they're entering our property um, so they can act accordingly. Um, so letting us know the 
um, condition of those. Um, sometimes the signs fall down. We have very small signs. So letting us know all of that, um, looking for invasive species. Um, I'll talk more about some of the most common ones later. Um, looking for evidence of wildlife activity. So whether that's trees that have been eaten, trees that have been pulled out of the ground or um, you know, rubbed against so that bark is peeling, um, finding scat or other wildlife tracks is just always something to note for us. Um, looking for trails um, or vehicle tracks. So our, um, our properties don't have maintained trails and that's something that's really important to us. So if you do see trails being formed or active vehicle tracks, that is something we want to know about because it's not an activity that is allowed on our properties. Um, checking on culverts and bridges, checking their condition, um, checking the condition of fences and gates um, is all really helpful. Um, and then letting us know about dumping sites and our campsites. There's some properties where people um, camp there for a little bit. And so that's something that we need to know about so we can ask them to move along. Um, and in terms of uh, invasive species, and I'll talk more about this later, but um, one thing that your binder will include is a guide, the Thurston County's Guide to Noxious Weeds. Um, so that can really help you to identify um, those species. So, so when you're out there, um, including observing things, there's also some physical stewardship that you can get involved with. So um, one of those things is removing invasive species like we've been talking about off and on this whole time. So um, for example, here we have a photo of um, a volunteer work party um, this past fall um, in the OHOP Valley and we were removing ivy with volunteers. Ivy is one of those invasives that we put in bags so it can't regrow. Um, and next up, we're looking at a photo also in the OHOP of a plant protector removal work party. So um, that's another thing that you can do is removing old plant protectors. Um, they, we put them on when we first plant the plants and then we like to leave them on for a little over three years usually. Um, but we'll let you know if you're at a site where there's plant protectors to remove because um, at some point the plants outgrow them and it's a detriment to them to continue to have them on. So that's a really helpful way you can um, support us because we have thousands and thousands and thousands of tubes to remove always. Um, so moving on to invasive species, these are just a few that we're gonna go over. Um, scotch broom, so like Zoe was talking about, um, like I've showed you a few photos of, um, removing scotch broom is a really helpful thing to do. A lot of it is um, a weed wrench is required to remove it. Some of the small stuff you can pull by hand, but um, a weed wrench is something we're always happy to lend you. We have many, many at our disposal. Um, and right here we have, I'm sure you know, Himalayan blackberry. Um, this is a very, very fast growing plant that just takes over, grows tall, grows wide. Um, and it has really yummy berries. So you can always eat the berries, but then also um, spend some time removing it if you can. Um, for that one, we use uh, loppers to cut the big stems, and then we use a shovel to dig out the root balls. Um, so it's a, a labor of love, but worth it every year because it comes back. Um, next up, we have English ivy. So just like in the previous slide showing you that work party where we pull it out and put it in bags. Um, so that's something that you can do as a site steward. And lastly, but not least, and there are so many more invasive species that you can learn about um, is spotted jewelweed. So this is one that we also ask that you bag, but this one is I'd say uh, easier one to remove. It comes out very easily out of the ground, no tools involved. Um, so that's also a great one. This one grows often next to streams and creeks. 
Um, so let me have a little sip of tea. Um, so this is something um, at your site. When you finish your track, you've looked at everything you want to look at, then you're going to go um, in this first image, you'll see this is an example of a track that someone did. Um, and then in the second image, you'll see this red circle surrounding the icon with the small yellow one. So clicking that brings you um, back to the reporting form. And on the reporting form at the top is where you'll click stop visit. So that's important. Um, it stops the time um, that you spend on your site visit. And it also brings you back to the reporting form where you can um, fill in the rest of the questions, answer the questions. We ask that you fill out every single question if you can, if it's relevant. Um, and uh, here, this next slide is gonna be showing you a couple of those questions, examples of those questions. So, um, you can identify what stewardship task you did. So you can say um, that you removed scotch broom for half an hour, what have you. Um, you can update us on how you think some of the plantings are doing. Um, you can write down who went with you on the site visit. You can say um, if you ran into anybody, any dumping sites, um, site conditions, all of those things sort of write more in depth um, if you have something to explain um, or explain maybe some images that you took. Um, and the second image is showing invasive weed information. So that's a section where you can tap on some of the options there and maybe they'll help also jog your memory of maybe you saw another invasive species. Um, so those, those are all the aspects of your site visit. Um, while you're at your site. And when you return home, you can also continue to edit that reporting form. Um, if that's easier for you, you can, there's a desktop version of the website. So you can go in there and edit your site. You have access to your site visit. Um, so you can go in and, and change any of that anytime. Um, if you did do your site visit um, without uh, cell service, then when you go home um, into cell service, into Wi Fi, you can open the app again and it should sync directly then, but that's an important step is to open it again once you're in service. You can also click the sync button um, just to confirm that it has indeed gone through. And then um, what you'll get received from us is an email um, in response to your site visit, ideally within two business days, um, responding to your findings and thanking you for your report. Um, so, Another optional activity is uh, to host a work party or a nature walk. So I talked a bit about this already, um, but it's something that we think is a really, really fun way to engage the community and also make your time out on the land uh, more rewarding. So um, it's something that we will work with you on. Um, it involves getting you um, liability waivers um, for your guests. Um, and we're also happy to help you, you know, get all the tools, engage volunteers, um, and even, um, you know, send out information to the greater community if you're hoping to open it up to more folks. So um, a nature walk can look like if you have a little expertise on birds or plants or um, bugs, whatever that might be, and you want to share it with some people, that's an awesome, awesome opportunity for you to share and for other folks to learn. Um, or it can just be, you know, removing ivy at your site and you want to get a certain area finished and all hands on deck is helpful. Um, so in order to set any of those up, uh, just please email me. Um, it's volunteer at nisqualilandtrust.org. Um, and all this information will be in an email um, at the end of today. But um, that is, it's a great opportunity for all, everybody. And I'm sure I know a lot of site stewards, current site stewards have told me that they really hoped that they could get involved more and learn, or not learn, but meet other site stewards and sort of create community that way. So this is um, a great way that you can all do that. Um, a quick reminder, letting you know, 
some things maybe obvious, maybe not on what not to do on our sites. Um, ideally, you don't bring dogs. There are a few sites where a leash dog is permitted and I will let you know those in the email. Um, but in general, dogs are not allowed on our properties. Horses are not allowed on the properties. Harvesting, um, you're allowed to eat some berries while you're out there, what have you. Um, but we ask that you don't bring those off the property. Um, camping is not allowed. You can, you know, go out there, walk around, have a picnic, but don't camp there overnight. Um, anything that, you know, disturbs the soil or disturbs the um, plants is not okay. Um, having fires is not allowed. Um, no dumping, no boating, and then no hunting. So we've reached finally our first opportunity to um, ask some in-person verbal questions. Um, you can also uh, write questions in the chat right now. Um, Courtney will be answering those. And um, if you have other questions, please raise your hand and we will call on you. It can be about anything we've talked about so far. Um, hmm. maybe we don't have any questions maybe we don't have any questions which is okay too um, and we will have a question um, open questions at the end of this workshop in which we will stop the recording um, and just have open floor for questions. So if that is suits you better, then look out for that. Um, with that said, um, I think let's continue on, um, make up for lost time and um, hear from Chris Peck, who is going to talk to us about the various birds that you might find in the, the Squally watershed. Um, he's an avid birder, and he also used to be an AmeriCorps member with the Nisqually Land Trust, as well as many other things. So, Chris, if you could introduce yourself more in depth and um, let us know about all the birds. Thank you for joining us. Of course. Thanks for hosting, as always. Uh, my name is Chris Peck. I've been working with uh, the Nisqually Land Trust in various capacities since 2012. Uh, when I was actually in Lottie's position as volunteer uh, coordinator, AmeriCorps member. Um, and I was one of, I think 2012 is when we first made this workshop. So it's cool to see how far it's come, by the way. <laughs> I just, I, before I just monologued for like two hours. Uh, so this is a much better setup. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> today I'm going to be reviewing some of the birds you'll find on various Nisqually Land Trust properties. Um, I tried to find photos only of uh, pictures that we've taken, my partner Kirsten and I, uh, on Nisqually Land Trust properties. I think there are only a couple that aren't taken on various properties. So um, excited to talk about those. And just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm um, going to talk about common year-round species a little bit. Of course, we won't be able to cover every single bird. Like, for example, um, I'm a caretaker. Me and my partner are caretakers on Nisqually Land Trust property out in Yelm for Yelm Shoreline properties. And we have a running tally of all the prop or birds we've seen on this property and it's 84 species. So I'm not gonna be able to talk about, you know, the hundred some odd species where you're, you'd see in Thurston, Pearson, Lewis County. Um, so I'm gonna try to make it short and stick, be, you know, a, a little bit cognizant of time. Cause I think the last time I did this, I ran over a long time. Anyways, so uh, as you can see with these photos here, uh, we at Yelm Shoreline saw um, these great horned owl chicks in this nest actually right off of a main trail, which surprised us. You can see all the wash, as we call it, which is basically bird droppings. And as uh, Kirsten, my partner, was jogging this trail, she was like, huh, look at that. That looks a little weird. Why is there all this white all over this tree? And then she saw these little fuzzballs um, <laughs> in this little little cavity. Uh, and there were, were three chicks originally in, in this clutch here, and even one of them disappeared. So these are the only two <laughs> that we got photos of. Uh, and here, can you go to the next slide? 
There's the there's the mom. It took us forever to find. <laughs> they blend in so well. So we saw the chicks with the wash, but we didn't find the mom for, I don't know, a couple of weeks because we went and visited just to see how uh, their growth was going because I'm, I'm just curious. Um, we both are curious of, of that life cycle kind of. And owls, especially owl chicks, look really funny over time. <laughs> so like as they grow, they change uh, <laughs> and they look goofier and goofier until they turn into this beautiful uh, animal that you see here. Um, and just real quick, I also wanted to mention, I wanted to mention this before, I saw some birders uh, in this presentation. <laughs> I saw uh, a screen where somebody was looking uh, through a scope and either you're birding or hunting and I assume you're birding. Uh, so that's cool. And I also saw John Grettenberger's name in here and he's um, he's been sending lists of birds on land trust properties since I was an AmeriCorps member. So there are people who have been around for a long time. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to provide some photos of some of the year-round common species you'll see throughout the watershed. You'll find a lot of these species in the upper watershed near Ashford and Mature Forest, and you'll also find them in the lowlands. They're kind of all over the place. Uh, and of course, I couldn't provide all of the, the birds that are common, like in here, of course, you'll get a song sparrow, which is one of the most common species, but they're so common, I don't think I've ever taken a photo of one, so I couldn't find a picture of it and put it in here. Uh, so red-breasted nuthatches are species that you'll see climbing up trees. So if there are two species out here, there's a red-breasted nuthatch and a brown creeper, and they both crawl vertically up trees. Um, so they're, they're pretty unique in that way, and there are only two species that are going to do that, but they're all over the place. Uh, you'll find them at elevation, you know, up to probably 5,000 feet, and you'll see them down even at, um, you know, at the refuge right on Puget Sound. Um, and, you know, the, the picture of the house fish isn't the best, but uh, there you go. Uh, next slide, please. So I also wanted to talk about common migrants. So you have year-round species that you'll find throughout the watershed. And then I also wanted to include some migratory species that you'll only see in spring, summer, and into early fall, but that are common that you'll see throughout the watershed. Uh, and yellow rumped warbler is one of those that I wanted to highlight because it is interesting in the way that they migrate from Central and South America. And early spring, you'll see them everywhere in the lowlands. I mean, you'll find hundreds at a time in the lowlands at the refuge. They just kind of flood all at one time. And then it's like snap of the fingers and they're all of a sudden all up in the mountains later in the summer. Uh, so they migrate in, hang out in the lowlands for a little bit, and then they go up uh, to elevation to um, actually breed. Uh, and the black-headed grosbeaks are another really common one that will, um, you hear them, same with yellow warblers, you hear them more than you'll see them because they like to hang out in dense shrubbery. Um, but they're they're really common. I mean, we have a nesting pair at Elm Shoreline every year, um, the, right next to our cabin that we live in. Uh, so they're they're around all over the place. And the black throated gray warbler is less common. They hang out much higher in the trees uh, for the most part. But you'll see them in upland and lowland. Uh, and also, just wanted to if you wanted to go back just real quick, if you wanted to, can anybody tell me the species that are down in the bottom middle and right? Anybody know what those are? Feel free to put it in the chat. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, correct. Yeah, an American goldfinch. We're also getting lesser goldfinches up here, which come from California, which isn't too, too common. They're slowly moving north. If you're familiar with a bird called the California scrub jay, they also are typically not from around here, but because of food availability, they're slowly moving farther and farther north. So we're seeing not only just Stellar's jays, the blue ones with the mohawks, but also a different type of jay um, that are beautiful. They look more like Western bluebirds, but they're coming up here. Same thing with lesser goldfinches. And that is awesome. You saw a calliope hummingbird. I've never seen one in this area. Typically, we only have rufous hummingbirds that migrate and then Anna's hummingbirds that are year round. So Anna's hummingbirds are the ones you're going to see in the winter. And it's almost always Anna's that you'll see locally here. 
Okay, next slide. So I wanted to highlight just elevation migration a little bit. You have migrants that come from Central and South America, sometimes all the way from, you know, like the bottom of South America and Chile uh, and come all the way up here. But you also have elevation migrators. There are species that don't migrate that far, but they just go in the summer. They'll be in the um, uplands or, or lowlands and then switch in, in the opposite season. So for example, ruby crown kinglets, you'll see inner yards in the summer, um, or sorry, in the winter. I got that mixed up. Um, and then in the summer, they go up to elevation, sometimes up to 10,000 feet to breed. So you won't see any ruby crown kinglets in the lowlands in the summer, but you'll see them in the winter. They're all over properties right now. And then you have the varied thrushes, which also come down to the lowlands in the winter. Uh, but then you'll see them at elevation in the summer. Yeah, exactly. We have varied thrushes all over Yelm Shoreline properties right now too. Um, they just like to hang around and you'll hear their little, little vocalizations. They're pretty fun. And then uh, Townsend's warblers um, also tend to elevation migrate. We'll see them in the lowlands in the winter uh, and not as much in the summer. You have to go up elevation, in, at least in my experience, to see them in the summer. Okay, next slide, please. I love this photo so much. We, you can get the best photos of swallows at Powell Creek Pastures. I think you could have that photo of the tree swallows. It just signifies so much in the world right now, but we won't go down that road. Um, and so you have tree swallows uh, that nest in nesting boxes at Powell Creek Pastures. Ed, ta Ed Kenny talked a little bit about this awesome property. It is one of the best properties to go see birds in the entire watershed, in my opinion. You just have a wide variety of species. Uh, and also George Walter, who we talked about before and some volunteers installed um, nesting boxes for specifically for the Western bluebirds out of Pell Creek Pastures, but tree swallows and, and Ed may be able to talk about this more too, but tree swallows have been able to outcompete the Western bluebirds in those nesting boxes so far. Um, and again, like I, it's like cheating at photography there. If you go out there and you're at all interested in wildlife photography, I'd recommend the pastures just because there's so much out there in the spring. Um, and what's cool about the pastures is you get all, uh, pretty much all of the swallow species that you can get in Washington, um, except for purple martins, I think are the only ones swallow species you can't get out there. I've seen bank swallows and tree swallows, violet green swallows, northern ruffling swallows. You got all of them there, which is kind of cool. Uh, next slide, please. And these are the nesting boxes I was talking about. You can see this funny little tree swallow sticking his head out going, yeah, I love the NLT. Uh, I like that we bended that bird box, uh, by the way. Um, and there's a, obviously that's a newer one, but on the right there with the Western bluebird collecting nesting material that was also taken out at Powell Creek Pastures. Um, I haven't seen too many Western bluebirds uh, out um, in the spring utilizing those nesting boxes, but I see them at Powell Creek Pastures and also Powell Creek Spooner uh, every year, pretty much. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. And then also in more pasture habitat, which is what, of course, Powell Creek Pastures, Powell Creek Spooner, you're going to have that are open previously agricultural fields that were planting and reforesting, you'll typically find different species there than you would in say densely forested riparian habitat or upland mature forest habitat. These are species that typically sparrows that you'll only find in pastures um, and open areas. That's the chipping sparrow, savanna sparrow, um, and white crown sparrow in particular. Um, and Savannah sparrows are really great. You can see one, uh, they have a beautiful little song. There's one perched on the stake right there. Chipping sparrows, you'll also only find in that area. Golden crown sparrows, you typically won't find in pasture, but I wanted to highlight them because we're talking sparrows. So there we go, I put that in there. Um, golden crowns, you'll typically find uh, feeding together along trails. Um, you'll, f you'll see them a lot at the refuge if you go to the Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge, especially this time of year. They go north to breed, so you won't see them in the summer. Okay, next slide. And then in open areas, of course, you'll find uh, kestrels in particular in open ag agricultural land. If you ever see a small bird of prey perched 
on a wire looking over some pastures that's most likely going to be an American kestrel. And then red tail hawks um, are all over the place in the old pastures as well. But you also see red tails in um, wide variety of habitats. I see them in densely forested areas as well. Okay, next slide. I'm trying to go quick because I know. I'm, uh, it's off now, Al. Come back. So he's. I can still see you. Oh. Hi, Martin. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't seen Martin in forever, so this is great. Um, I hear some woodpeckers. Um, we, of course, pileateds are going to have more an upland habitat, uh, coniferous, mature forest. Typically, that's where you'll find them, but I've also seen them in riparian areas. All of these species you're going to see in a variety of habitats, except for the one uh, in the bottom, which is a downy woodpecker. There are two woodpeckers that look very similar. Downy woodpeckers. Um, have smaller bills, as you can see. Hairy woodpeckers have a little bit longer bills, but otherwise they're hard to tell apart. Um, I've specifically only seen um, downies in uh, riparian, dense riparian habitat. Um, it, I haven't seen too many in upland. Sapsuckers are also more riparian. Same thing with northern flickers. Uh, next, please. Uh, some species highlights. I really love western tanagers. They're like the parrots of the northwest. I see them all over Eatonville. Typically, uh, when they migrate out here, they migrate from Central and South America. Typically, you'll see them um, in uplands, at least that's been my experience. So this one I took pictures of at Van Eaton on the Michelle River. Uh, but we had a nesting pair at Yelm Shoreline uh, right next to our house. Um, so it's kind of a variety. But if you ever see a bright yellow bird with a red head uh, and some black wings with white wing bars, that is almost always going to be a Western tanager. Love those birds. Next slide. And then and some other highlights. I just saw the chat talk about evening gross beaks. We've been seeing a lot of evening gross beaks the last few years. Um, they tend to follow food availability. Uh, based on my experience, you can see these uh, big leaf maple seeds that they're munching on in the winter. Um, I've almost only ever seen them exclusively in, in the winter in Yelm, uh, but I know that they're all around. You can see them in Lacey. Um, closer to population, uh, but otherwise you'll get you'll get them more consistently up in Ashford area in the uplands, and then a Bullock's Oriole, which is like our the West Coast version of a Baltimore Oriole. Um, saw this one at Red Salmon Creek. I haven't seen one in like three years. They really they hang out in dense shrubbery. Really hard to see uh, for the most part, but uh, love these guys. Uh, next, please. And then, uh, gosh, you, oh yeah, this is, um, I almost did the oddball slide, but this is actually what you'll see in the river main stem typically or along uh, the Michelle River um, and tributaries, other tributaries, even like the Ohop, of course, bald eagles during salmon runs, you'll see all over the place uh, in uh, uplands and um, lowlands, well, where the salmon runs are. You'll see them more, of course. And then you got spotted sandpipers that hang out on the river. Um, they're the little shorebirds that are, you know, flying up and down the river. Uh, they actually nest on gravel bars. Um, and then you got American Dipper, which is one of my favorite birds. Those dippers only hang out actually in streams or feed in streams and then nest right next to, to streams. So we've seen nests like on cliff walls right above the Michelle River. Uh, right above rapids. They hang out in rapids and, and feed in rapids as well. And then you got your belted kingfishers, which you'll see all up and down the river. Next slide, please. And then I didn't get a chance to cover waterfowl at all. There's so much we can cover here. Um, there's, as Ed mentioned in the chat, you can see trumpeter swans occasionally. You have beautiful hooded mergansers, pintail uh, in freshwater, tons of waterfowl you can see throughout the watershed, mostly in the lower watershed. Um, where you have more freshwater ponds uh, and more open water. Uh, you have shorebirds like greater yellow legs, which migrate every year uh, up from Central and South America. That's a huge category we didn't cover. And you'll see them in the refuge and also um, in near shore habitats. Those are super important. When it comes to near shore habitats, one of the super um, important indicators of overall health of Puget Sound is a bird called the pigeon guillemot, which nests on in near shore bluffs. Um, and they're the only nesting uh, seabirds in South Puget Sound. Uh, so they're an indicator of how healthy South Puget Sound is, if they're thriving or not, because they eat very specific forage fishes, as we call them, which are sand lance, you have gunnel. And if those populations are not um, 
healthy, then the pigeon guillemots are not going to be healthy either. And if forage fish aren't healthy, salmon don't have food either. So they're an important indicator. And then I love cedar wax wings. They're just really beautiful. They have awesome little mohawks. Uh, okay, next slide. And then the story I'll leave you off on is a story of a ruffed grouse, which at Yelm Shoreline, typically you'll see them upland um, in mature forest, but you also have them uh, in the lowlands occasionally like this, this grouse. This grouse became very agitated with us, long story short, because we were um, using dead blow mallets to hit uh, the wooden stakes into the ground for planting. And we think it sounded a lot like the territorial drumming, the of the of this grouse. This grouse became very upset and was jumping at people's faces as people were kneeling down to try to plant plants. Uh, our old executive director, Joe Kane, his job was literally just having a shovel in front of his grouse. So this grouse couldn't attack volunteers, would fly at you from 100 yards away. And we eventually kind of fell in, you know, we, we liked the guy at the end of it. He was defending his territory um, and did not care about the 50 humans that were all up in his business, just trying to plant some trees. Uh, so we named him affectionately Oscar the Grouse. We, we think he may have gotten too friendly with a coyote at some point because uh, we haven't seen him since that planting year, but this guy was incredible. And you'll see, you can see these rough grouse pretty commonly up in the mountains, um, but not too much in the lowlands. Okay. okay, that's it. I went a little bit over time. It's hard for me not to. Uh, so I appreciate you all listening. Um, if you go to the next slide, there's some resources about bird watching, um, local groups, uh, if you want to learn more about birding, you also have um, certain guides, Sibley Guide to Birds, All About Birds, and then Audubon is a great resource. Generally, if you want to get into reporting birds and become a citizen scientist, like what I do and also John Grettenberger does, is um, report your findings on eBird. You have to be confident about what you've seen, but any data is good data. Um, so, you know, if you want to jump in, feel free to do it. I, myself, and my partner Kirsten also uh, lead bird walks at Powell Creek Pastures, typically every spring, uh, sometimes in the fall, but the spring is migration peak. Uh, and we teach you about bird song. We know bird songs. We also would, would teach you about the species that we're seeing in general. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Sorry I went over uh, <laughs> Lottie and Courtney. And um, thank you for your interest in becoming site stewards. We want it to be mutually beneficial for all of you. So whatever your interests are, um, you know, whether it's bird watching or wildlife watching, that's my big thing. Uh, make it fun for you. So uh, thanks again. Have a good one, you guys. Thank you so much, Chris. That's awesome. We're doing great on time. No worries. Thanks for sharing all about those birds. I know so little about birds, so I was just blown away by how many there were and how beautiful they were and their little unique quirks. Thanks for sharing all those. Um, so now, we're going to move along um, to learn about the salmon of the Nisqually watershed. And Maya is going to tell us about those. Maya is our community engagement um, AmeriCorps member with the Nisqually Land Trust. So over to you, Maya. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so like Lottie said, I'm the community engagement AmeriCorps member with the Land Trust this year. It's a newer position. Um, they split the volunteer coordinator kind of into two different positions this year. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I just wanna take a couple minutes to talk about uh, salmon in the Nisqually River and the tributaries um, and how it relates to the restoration work that we do and the site steward program. Um, so you might have noticed on the slide um, at the beginning of the presentation talking about our partners um, that we partner with a lot of salmon recovery organizations and a pretty large amount of our funding as an organization comes from money set aside for salmon recovery and salmon are one of the main beneficiaries of the work that we do. Um, so there are five species of salmon in the Nisqually River uh, including steelhead. Um, so that is coho salmon, chum salmon, steelhead, salmon slash trout, um, Chinook salmon and pink salmon. And Chinook and steelhead are listed as threatened species, um, which is a step or two away from endangered. So they're not quite endangered, but they 
are threatened. So we put a lot of work into maintaining good habitat for them to try to um, help their populations recover. Um, and the Nisqually does not have a significant sockeye run, um, but it's not it's not unheard of that you would encounter a sockeye every once in a while in Ohop Creek. Um, we saw one this fall. It was large and looked very out of place in the little creek, but they're there sometimes. We don't have a really significant run. Um, you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Yeah, so um, different species of salmon have different streams and environments that they like to spawn or rear in. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about those uh, different preferences. So chum salmon like uh, more downstream, smaller tributaries. Um, they don't generally migrate very far up rivers. They tend to spawn pretty quickly after entering the fresh water. Um, and so in the Nisqually watershed, uh, they prefer like Muck Creek, Yelm Creek, McAllister Creek, and Red Salmon Creek. Um, those are really important uh, chum streams. And uh, the Nisqually winter chum are a really special population. Um, we have a, a distinct population from the rest of Puget Sound chum because historically those chum streams that I just talked about um, have been in prairie habitats. So they dry out. Um, and fill with water later in the year, um, which kind of caused our chum population to hold in the Puget Sound before migrating upstream. Um, and historically, the peak of the run was in like February and March, um, which is much, much later than other chum runs in the Puget Sound. So that's a really special population um, with a lot of cultural significance too. It's always been a food source um, into the winter and spring when other species aren't as prevalent. Um, and the upper Michelle River and Muck Creek have both been identified as really important steelhead spawning habitat. Um, they, uh, we've done a lot of restoration work and making sure we preserve that type of habitat. Um, and Ohop Creek has been identified as really important Chinook habitat. And if you're familiar with um, the land trust, you might know that we've done uh, a, a lot of work over a long period of time to restore Ohop Creek. Um, and that is one of the main goals of that is to um, maintain Chinook habitat. Uh, and so the lower Ohop contains a lot of really important rearing habitat. Um, while the middle OHOP is where Chinook prefer to spawn. Um, and Chinook also spawn in the larger tributaries of the Nisqually, as well as the main stem of the river itself, generally not like right in the center, in the, in the deepest point, but um, they will spawn in the main stem of the river, kind of on the sandbars. Um, yeah, I just saw someone mention bull trout I don't know much about bull trout in the Nisqually. We definitely have uh, trout. We have rainbow and cutthroat trout. Um, but yeah, I am not sure about the non-anadromous fish that we have in the river. Um, oh, and this, this screenshot on the uh, slide is from Salmonscape, which is a um, database uh, uh, created by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, where you can, um, it's a map, you can move it around, you can select the species you're interested in, and it will show you these um, color coordinated maps of where they have been seen and where they're spawning and rearing and where they're not able to access because of some barriers um, to their passage. Um, and you can see, I think I selected fall Chinook for this example, um, but it's really interactive. It's really cool. And I put the URL to it on the slide, but if you look up Salmonscape, you'll be able to find it. Um, so depending on where you're stewarding or where you're, um, yeah, what property you're stewarding, you can go on Salmonscape and find out what type of fish and what time of year you could see those fish. 
um, which would be really interesting. And so it's an opportunity to see salmon, which is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, okay, you can go to the next slide. So um, Pacific salmon are a keystone species or they are all keystone species, meaning that they define their entire ecosystem and without them, a lot of other species wouldn't be able to exist. Um, and one species in particular um, are, uh, are orcas in the Puget Sound. So um, you might hear a lot about orca recovery. It is a hot topic in Washington. There's a lot of time and money being put into the recovery of our Puget Sound orca. Um, and salmon recovery and orca recovery are really connected. So uh, our southern resident orca prefer Chinook salmon um, for food. Uh, but a lot of the time when they come down to the South Puget Sound, they're chasing the squally winter chum. Um, and so, you know, having healthy salmon populations is really important to helping our orcas recover. And the um, transient orca populations uh, prefer to eat marine mammals, um, which is a lot of the time seals, uh, which is interesting because um, seals eat salmon as well. So when we see the transients uh, come into the South Puget Sound, uh, studies have shown that salmon uh, survival has increased a lot because the seals are scared and they're hiding from the orcas so they're not hunting and eating all the salmon. So there's a lot of connections between orca recovery and salmon recovery and um, it might seem really separated but the work that we're doing on our properties um, is affecting salmon which are affecting orca. So even though they're far away it's all connected. Um, yeah, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Great, so um, the properties that we're stewarding um, might be, or that you are stewarding, might be on the main stem of the river or one of its tributaries. Um, and the restoration and work and monitoring that we do on these properties um, affects salmon in a variety of ways. So one way, you can give me one click, Lati. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, having a healthy riparian zone um, creates shade, um, which helps to keep the water really cold. And that's something salmon prefer. They survive a lot better in uh, really cold water. Um, do another little click. <laughs> and uh, they also um, prefer clear water or water with low turbidity. Um, and so having a lot of trees and shrubs along the rivers helps to stabilize the riverbank and keep all that sediment out of the water. Um, another way that uh, having a healthy riparian zone with a lot of vegetation helps salmon is that when trees fall or lose branches, they provide large woody debris, which is really essential salmon habitat. Um, salmon use log jams to hide from predators and to rest um, and juvenile salmon use it as a feeding area to catch little aquatic insects um, when they're rearing and preparing to go out to the salt water. And then one more click. Yeah, and so a riparian or a healthy riparian zone provides um, insects, habitat for insects that will then, you know, fall into the water and be eaten by juvenile salmon. And different species spend a different amount of time rearing. Um, for example, chum tend to migrate out to the saltwater almost immediately after they emerge from the gravel. Um, but other species like chinook or coho will spend a couple weeks to even a year um, rearing in the freshwater environment uh, and having a lot of uh, insects is really important for that life stage. Um, and then the last way that uh, having a healthy riparian zone impacts salmon is that uh, trees are uh, carbon sequesters <laughs> um, and they intake carbon dioxide and output oxygen, which helps oxygenate the water um, that salmon are swimming in, which is how they breathe. They, they breathe oxygen that is dissolved into the water. So uh, it, we've shown that 
having a a uh, healthy riparian zone with a lot of trees increases the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water. So when you're um, out walking around the property that you're stewarding or you're picking up trash or you're finding an invasive species that we need to come in and do some control on, um, you are impacting salmon and you can think about the, the greater impact of the work that you're doing and even though you might not be able to see the salmon at that time, we're there for the salmon and you can feel good about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's all for me and salmon. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Maya. That's awesome. Thanks for connecting it all back to the work we do. Um, so now let's take a look at, uh, a closer look at some of the properties that um, we have throughout the watershed. And this is a time for you to do a little reflection and think about maybe what properties or area that you'd be interested in being a steward for, thinking about the birds that are at various spots, thinking about the salmon, thinking about um, you know invasives that you might wanna be working on. And I'll tell you about some of those nuances of the properties. So um, here we have a map, an overview of the Nisqually watershed going from Mount Rainier um, all the way down to the old growth and mature forests of the upper Nisqually watershed and then down to the streams and the floodplains and the riparian areas um, of the lower Nisqually watershed um, and then all the way down to the, our marine conservation area um, which has tidelands and beaches and bluffs and coastal wetlands um, and marine riparian forests. So that's going to be our trajectory in this next coming section, starting at the top and working our way down through a lot of those stars on this map. Um, so first up, we have our Mount Rainier Gateway property. Um, and I'll um, before we get started, I'll just let you know that not every single one of our properties is open to site stewards. So you will see some um, areas on maps that are highlighted that are not included um, in sites that you can site steward, but I'll, I'll show you as we go. So um, you'll say wow about Mount Rainier Gateway because um, there's lots of big trees here. Um, it's the site of where we held our mycology walk this past fall. So lots of fungi to view. Um, maybe some of you joined us there. It was a wonderful, wonderful collaboration with, um, I believe it was South Sound, or yeah, South Sound Mushroom Club. Um, and so these properties are close to Ashford. They're close to Mount Rainier. So recreation, food, um, all kinds of good things here. And um, the names of these properties I have listed in the bottom corner. Um, take note of the overall um, title of the slide if these are properties that you might be interested in um, as uh, these are the names that will be listed in the sign up document that I will send you. So just keep take note of those if you want. Um, and here I'm gonna go through a couple uh, images of various properties. So. Um, I'm sorry, the white background got a little shifted. Um, but this first image on the left is Mount Rainier Gateway to Homa Canyon. Um, and then the next one is Mount Rainier Gateway, Tina's Creek. Um, a lot of these places have various planting projects going on, um, invasives removal. I know to Homa Canyon, we did a work party removing uh, blackberry this past fall and I know we did not finish so there's plenty more to go around there. Um, Mount Rainier Gateway Q property, um, that's a property I've never been to but um, yeah we can talk more about that if you want more information. Um, and then moving down the watershed north <laughs> um, we get to our Michelle River and Ohop Creek areas. Um, so this area is wonderful. Um, the Michelle River properties have the engineered log jams I was mentioning, um, as well as a lot of beautiful river rocks and clay and just very undeveloped and beautiful areas with um, 
more mature forests. Um, the lower OHOP uh, is a very special place. It's um, the properties, most of them are right along OHOP Creek. So you have access to the creek as well as seeing um, our restoration project where we re-meandered OHOP Creek, um, most of it, and we're continuing to work on that. Um, and so the Michelle properties, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, I bet you can't. Um, you can, okay, so um, I can point out a few of these. So right here we have um, the Michelle properties, which are right on the Michelle River. So it's a, a big river, you can walk right down to it. So that's a really awesome spot. And then we also have the upper and lower OHOP properties here um, that, uh, are all quite close together. So some of these are opportunities to steward maybe two sites at a time. They're close together. Um, some of them are larger, some are smaller. So something to think about. Um, and here's some beautiful photos from a few of the properties. So on the left, we have the lower OHOP Valley um, property. This is on Peterson Road in the OHOP. Uh, this was this photo was taken, I believe, um, during a right after a flooding event. So the creek was um, very high, um, but a beautiful, a beautiful shot there. Um, we have we've been doing lots of work on Peterson Road. There's invasives to remove. There's tubes to remove. All kinds of things. Um, up next, we have the Michelle um, State Route Seven property. Um, so this one's really beautiful. Um, it has, it's not accessible, the whole property, but there are some uh, areas where it's accessible, but it's definitely more of a hike. Um, so that's something to keep in mind with that property. Um, you can definitely ask questions at the end or put in the chat properties that are more flat or, or more of a hike if that's something that um, is important to you. Um, last photo here on this slide is Michelle and Van Eaton property. Um, these properties are close to Eatonville. Um, and this one has a, an, old, an old road that um, sort of takes you through the property. So that's something nice about this one. And it takes you right down to the water. Um, and we have plantings there and lots of invasives to remove. So that's a really awesome property. Um, continuing on north, um, we have the middle reaches. So um, this includes our Powell, um, Powell Creek sites. So we have um, three Powell Creek sites on one road, and then we also have Powell Pastures on a separate road. So that's something to keep in mind. I know people get those confused a little bit. I know the naming um, is not so unique for each property, so it can be confusing. Um, we have our Lacamas Flats properties as well, right in that area, and then Thurston Ridge. So it, we on the map here, you'll see Thurston Ridge up here, um, moving down here to Lacamas Flats, and then here's our Powell Pastures and then Powell Creek sites um, here. And Muck Creek is not on this map, but close by, and it's up north somewhere over here. Um, so this area has is a very has a very dynamic stretch of the river with lots of gravel bars and log jams. So lots of changing um, conditions to see and look at um, erosion, all those kinds of things to keep an eye on. Um, it has areas of mature forest as well as open pasture that we're actively planting. Um, has great birding, as Chris was saying, that this is. I think he mentioned it's almost a cheap, a cheap place to go to take photos of birds and see birds because it's just, just you know, all kinds of birds you'll find out there. Um, as I said, many recent in progress plantings. This is um, the Powell Creek site is where we did our um, uh, Nisqually River Education Project collaboration um, this past fall, where we planted there for about two months with lots of volunteers. So. Um, that's that site, and um, some of them have some old roads and are, I'd say overall, it's, these um, sites are flatter, so maybe more accessible for some folks. Um, and to look at a few photos, we have um, this lovely tree photo at Powell Pastures. So this um, Powell Pastures has one of our oldest plantings 
Um, a lot of these trees are about 15 years old. So um, just a really great site to see these sort of teenage trees and um, somewhere where we also have a lot of restor work, re restoration work happening, um, invasives removal, as well as our current planting project is located there. So a lot of you have come out there recently. Thank you for your help. Um, and next we have Lacamas Flats. So this is our Miller property. Um, this is another place where we did um, Nisqually River Education Project plantings um, right next to the river, great access to the river, seeing the river, um, as well as um, opportunities for invasive removal. Um, the same goes for Nisqually Creek floodplain. Um, as I already mentioned, um, we're reforesting that field year by year. Um, and it's right next to the Nisqually River and close to Powell Creek. Okay, so um, Yelm Shoreline and Lower Reach. So why you'd love this site, um, I'd say it has quite um, easy river access. And um, so Lower Reach is the site that uh, Zoe, uh, the site steward was talking about um, and has beautiful cedar groves, um, enormous ant hills, and it's close to Yelm and McKenna. So things to think about. Um, High, Highway 507 goes through um, here, through here, I believe. Um, and uh, yes, a lot of these sites are um, things to think about. You may encounter other folks on these sites more often just because they're closer to city limits. Um, but do know it's never your responsibility to talk to anyone if they are doing something um, that's illegal. You can. Um, be friendly and pass the information on to us. Um, and the sites that are open for stewards here are Yelm Shoreline McKenna, which is actually this small little property right down here. And then also the lower reach, which is up here in the top left corner. And here's some photos from those sites. Um, lower reach here on the left, um, view of the river from the bank. It's a little bit of a raised bank, but the river's right there. Beautiful cedar trees here. Um, here is Yelm Shoreline McKenna in the middle. So um, we were just there the other day doing our annual site monitoring visit. Um, we checked on our plantings. Um, there's lots of big cedar trees right by the river. It was a beautiful place to have a lunch break. Um, found a little dumping. And uh, lower reach again, um, just showing the more mature understory happening there. And um, it's just a really beautiful site. It's small, but beautiful. Um, and I'd say include some climbing a little bit up some steeper slopes. So um, keep that in mind. And so we're reaching towards the end here. Um, I'm going to try and speed this up. Um, Nisqually Delta. So um, as you can see from this map, really beautiful estuary um, here in this um, larger photo or larger area. And then Hogham Bay also has its own pocket estuary. It has Mallard Cove. Um, and then Red Salmon Creek is over here by Highway 5, um, I-5. And it's located close to Olympia and DuPont. Here's some photos, Red Salmon Creek. Um, we have a work party coming up there next week. We're going to be removing ivy um, and then Hogham Bay. Um, here's some volunteers after a planting work party walking down to the cove and seeing that. We, also, we often like to include a, a little nature walk at the end of our work parties just to see the river. So, um, and last but not least, Anderson Island. So, um, so it's an island, um, it has tidal flats and wetlands and upland forests, um, beautiful salal and huckleberry. Um, keep in mind, you will have to take the ferry over there. So that makes it for having less flexibility in terms of when you go and when you leave and also cost $20 with your car. So things to keep in mind. Um, but we have one site, it's this whole area, South Oro Bay. Um, that's right on the bay and is open to site stewards. Here's some beautiful photos at Upland Forest area. We're actively replanting that and here is South Oro Bay. Okay, so the moment we've been waiting for. Um, 
So we, uh, the next step, if you are ready to sign up right now today, um, we're gonna put the link in the chat um, to sign up. We have a Google form. Um, it has all the sites on there. Um, it'll ask for your name and email. Um, but I'm also gonna send you a follow-up email today and that's gonna include this link. It's going to include some uh, more in-depth information about all the various properties. Um, as well as which properties you could bring a dog to. Um, and also just I'll be available for questions after via email also here on this web, uh, workshop webinar Zoom room. Um, so look out for that email and that's where um, you'll be able to find all that information, how to download the app. Um, and then after you um, do sign up, I will contact you to set up a one-on-one -on -one site steward orientation at your site. It'll be me coming out, you, I'll bring the binder, give you a binder, and we'll just go through it all to make sure you feel fully prepared to be a site steward. Um, so let's see. Yes, so participating in your site steward orientation. Um, a little more about the binder. It'll also include a parking placard, business card. So little cards you can hand out to people if you meet them to show you a little bit about who you are, why you're there, um, and everything else that you need to do um, your visit. Um, so we have a couple upcoming volunteer opportunities. Um, all of this is available on our website, misqualilandtrust.org. Um, and signups is through the website Eventbrite and it's all linked there in our website calendar. Um, so Anderson Island um, on Saturday the 12th and Powell Pastures, another planting. We're finishing up our plantings for this season um, in the month of February. So if you're hoping to come out and plant, these are some of our final opportunities. Um, and then we'll be doing a tube pull, removing plant protectors um, at Lackmas Flats in, on the 19th. Um, we're gonna have time for questions after this, but before we move into that and before we end the recording, um, I wanna thank you all so much for spending time with us today, learning about our program, having interest in our program, for being dedicated volunteers already, being site stewards already, for continuing to support us um, and show us engagement in, in this way. Um, and if you want to follow along um, on field days and work parties, but you can't come out, a great way to do that is through our Instagram and Facebook. Um, we post live updates of our work parties and sometimes midweek in the field action, as well as opportunities um, in the greater community. So thank you all for coming. We can end the recording um, of our site steward workshop now and we can get into questions. Um, using the hand, raised hand function and have a great, great rest, rest of your day. Thank you. So now, if anyone has any questions, um, Courtney, is the recording completed? Oh yeah, I'll, I'll stop it.